good evening, everyone, and I mean everyone, um, to the, this long-awaited launch of Catherine Bevis's debut pamphlet, Flamingo. It is a thing of beauty, both inside and out. And tonight, she's got two wonderful um, poets to support her, Vicky Morris and Jonathan Edwards. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Catherine, who uh, lots of people have lots to say about, frankly. So Catherine is a poet and poetry teacher from a former Hampshire Poet Laureate and founder of the Writing School Online. She is the selected poet for Magma, the Solitude Issue, and her poems have appeared widely in magazines and journals, including Poetry Wales, Poetry Review, Poetry Island Review, the London Magazine and Mislexia. This year, she won the Marcin Crawford Award for Poetry, the Poetry Society Members Competition, won the Second Light Poetry Competition and came second in the York Poetry Prize. Catherine designs and delivers poetry courses for adults online and in mental health settings, substance misuse recovery settings and prisons. And Flamingo is her debut pamphlet published by ourselves at Sarin. Now let me introduce you to Flamingo. So Flamingo introduces us to a troupe of wild, unique and captivating poems. Life and our embodiment are brought sharply into focus as we encounter a variety of subjects, including work, survival, love and mortality. Formally inventive, these hopeful and sometimes surreal poems are not afraid to confront complex or difficult emotions. Cancer is posed as a ring-tailed lemur, capering through the sufferer's body, and the title poem imagines death as a flamboyant transformation where the speaker shapeshifts into the afterlife. Each poem is a discovery and a joy. Flamingo is a debut of startling originality. And Don Patterson said that Catherine is a poet of real wisdom, compassion and fearlessness, with an almost old school faith in poetry as a way of shedding light, of making sense of the most senseless aspects of the world. Only a writer of considerable gifts could repeat the trick so consistently. And that is no small feat coming from Don Patterson. So please, without further ado, let me introduce you to the poet you've been wanting to hear, Catherine Bevis. Oh, Rian, that was such a lovely introduction. I'm so moved, like scrolling through these pages and seeing face after face of beautiful friends uh, and names of those that, that I love in this room. Thank you more than I can say. God, I'm moved and I haven't even started yet. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'll, I'll crack on. Sarah's going to screen share for us. So in my first sort of 12 minute set, um, I'm going to read you four or five poems that all kind of break the rules a little bit. Um, I, I, I think probably those who, who've known me for a long time know that I'm quite rebellious and I quite like to break rules. Um, I like taking risks in my poems. So I've tried to choose five poems for this first set that break a kind of unspoken poetic rule in some way. Um, and this first one breaks the rule of, 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 of central justification of having your poem run down the middle line of the page. Not meant to do that, everyone tut tuts it. But anyway, I, I, I have done it and I'm really pleased I did. Um, so this one's called Matryoshka. We're all in the family way, full of ourselves. In the pudding club, my dear. On our shelf, we gather dust like snowfall and listen to the sound of other people's children growing. Their girls, once born, are great squishy, smelly things that puke and puke and shit the sodding bed. Not ours. We are a nest with all our pretty chicks inside. We are the hatchling and the egg. Each of us is mother to a daughter who is pregnant with the next in line. Our bodies rhyme like the faces of the moon. All except our smallest. We don't talk about it, but let me say it softly. She was born with no space inside. That's right, she's wood all the way through. It's not that we judge her, understand, but we know as only mothers can, she'll never get to split herself in two. She'll never have to bear the others as we do. So 
So moving on, um, it's another toy poem, one I wrote a good while ago. And I think this one breaks the rule about never writing poems as acts of revenge against ex-boyfriends or ex-partners. Um, this is a, <laughs> this is one of those. I really enjoyed writing it. Um, I've got a couple of these in the collection, actually, this one called The Smuggler as well. Um, Anyway, I haven't named him, so I think it's OK, but I did get a great deal of kind of pleasure and empowerment from writing this one. Teddy. Delia suspected that her teddy bear was gaslighting her, but found it hard to pin down when he had begun. Was it when he said her new hat looked like an animal crawled onto your head and died there? Or when he made her say, hot water bottle over and over, calling her accent adorable. How the other toys at the tea party had laughed. Teddy said none of the other bears was good enough for Delia. Not the best version of her, the version only he could help her work toward. Paddington liked to spliff. Pooh was pretentious. Rupert was holding her back. And little Ted made her laugh too much and act like a crazy person. Order was important to Teddy. When he woke her at 1am, growling for picnic food right there, right then, Delia thought that something was maybe not okay. He made a list of silly words that she used. Serviette and settee, toilet and cheers. When she began to avoid bedtimes, got puffy drinking late into the night, Teddy said, there's more of you to love. He didn't do snuggles anymore. One time he rocked up on a girl's night out with the rag dolls, saying her lateness home showed, you don't respect the value of other people's time. It wasn't all bad. Teddy taught her the difference between less and fewer, it's and it's, no and yes. He was good at rules and there was much that Delia still needed to learn. So um, I thought I'd bring this one along because it's a bit meta. It's a poem about a poem and that is something um, and it's another of those rules. I, I've read a lot of really bad poems about poems, to be fair. Um, but I just fancied trying one of my own. And I had a failed poem that I wanted to just break up for parts and recycle. I often do that, see if I can do something else with it. So um, all of the text in, in kind of normal font is, is, is the outer poem, the shell, the surface poem. And all the text in italics is the kind of... Uh, poem within a poem. I feel like if Shakespeare can do a play within a play, I can do a poem within a poem. Here we go then. The title of this poem is, what's the title of this poem? And the first line explores that question. In fact, the whole first stanza sets it up, economically placing the reader in time and space. Late evening in November's suburbs, a light rain and introducing the poem's triggering subject, an urban fox scratting for scraps in the bin bag black. Next, a stanza of rich description, all glittering tarmac and street lamps haloing the night. The fox's coat is pictured as the hot chilli pelt of three-day-old kebab, the bloom of rust on iron railings, Smell is often underrated, so he is the musk that marks alleyways behind the houses' dreaming backs. Now, something needs to happen, and a little sound play wouldn't go amiss here, a tinkle on the piano keys. His brush tail cry slashes a trail through star-hushed skies. Then it's all action, action, action. Nothing slinks like him. Nothing bites and slices. Nothing ruts and gnaws and stinks like him. There's enough figuration so that we know it's a poem we're reading and not some other kind of text. Not a takeaway menu, say, or a knock-knock joke. About two thirds of the way in, there's an epiphany. No one sees as he sees. His flaming eyes steer the dark. And the poem swivels away from a, a wry and slightly weary exploration of its own mechanics into something more unconscious, 
more emotionally charged, a fear of yet desire for the wild, the unknowable, is never stated, but it's everywhere from this point on. There is no one so alone, alive, awake, alight. Then a final image, a piece of metaphorical surprise, concrete yet suggestive. Clunky exposition at this stage would entirely derail, derail the thing. As the poem dies, we're left only with a noiseless, savage page. No one rips flesh from the silence as he can. Yes, even to its clean, white bone. So this one is unfashionable in entirely its own way, um, in that it's a concrete poem. Um, and I've made it into the shape of a toilet cubicle for reasons that should become uh, more obvious as, as I read. It's based on my teacher training year um, in reality. Um, and I did spend a lot of time in the staff loose, just crying my eyes out. Brutal. I, I, you know, I learned a lot. I love being a teacher, but that year, man, it's terrible. Miss means both mother and no one. The trainee teacher is crying in the loo. This time, for both intensity and duration, she has achieved outstanding. And it's not Jed Simmons or bottom set year nine on Fridays period five. It's not the safeguarding training or differentiation six ways for every class. She isn't crying for the year 10 girls whose names she struggles to remember. So well have they hidden themselves behind long hair, immaculate behaviour and precisely average grades. The trainee teacher is crying in the loo, her heart a strip-lit cubicle whose bulb is on the blink. And it's not her failure to meet sub point four d of the teacher's standards that set her off on this occasion, nor is it the school uniform policy or the 223 books she has to mark each fortnight with rainbow highlighters, colour-coded for feedback, action and response. The trainee teacher is crying in the loo, her heart a plug of chewing gum sticking to her ribs. She's not crying about the spreadsheets in which she must evidence two sub-levels of expected progress for each pupil, regardless of the child. She's not crying for the boy who mimicked fingering her when her back was to the class, nor for the head who doesn't know her name. The trainee teacher is crying in the loo, her heart wrung and stinking as the mouldy mop head there's no budget to replace. She cries for let's call him Jaden Ahmed. Tom, held in isolation for a week because he threw a chair when his dad's parole date was postponed. Cries for let's call her Aisha, Kayla, Kim, who cuts and cuts and shows her all the wounds. Cries for the shrug of the designated safeguarding lead who's heard far worse than this today, for the 12-year-olds who can't yet read, for the school-to-prison pipeline, for let's call him Connor, Christos, Mo, slumped forever on the tutting chair outside the head of year. So I, I love um, I love to read poems which are musical and I love to listen to music. And I think a lot of that music finds its way into my poems and a lot of kind of English pure rhyme, actually, true rhyme like um, shake and cake or um, done and won f find their way into my poems. Um, and I know that, again, that's not very fashionable. I don't tend to put them at line endings. I smuggle them in where I think no one will notice them. Um, but it's my ear that I hope is wide awake when I'm, when I'm writing. It's just something I'm really into um, is the music of the poem. The darkening. It started with glowworms and phosphorescent fish, their lights blown out like candles on a cake. At matinees, footlights swallowed themselves entire, so we only guessed poor Gloucester's eyes were gouged and heard Leah shake his fists against the storm. Momentum took. Bulbs began to organise, to unionise down tools across the globe. 
Lighthouse beams refused to stroke the sea to sleep. Whole tower blocks played dead, their pupils blown. By tea time, even the bloodlit freckles of TV standby LEDs had mutinied. Dentist lamps sat down, sat in, called sick. We blamed the manufacturers. We blamed the government. Street lamps picketed the roads on which they lived. We knew we were screwed when matches joined the strike, flints declined to spark, magnifying glasses wouldn't catch. Oil lamps, tapers, flambeau took up arms. Conspiracy theorists had their day at last. Doom scrolling our darkened screens tonight, we are undone. We pray for dawn's red eye to open. Watch as stars put out their fires. One by one by one. Thank you so much. That's the end of my first set. Catherine, what an incredible first reading. Words cannot describe that was awesome. Thank you. Everyone's doing their sort of like their hostage applause where they cannot be heard. It's so surreal. I'm still not used to Zoom applause. Right then, I would now like to introduce um, our second reader for this evening, Vicky Morris. Vicky is a British Welsh poet, editor and writing tutor. She has been published in places like the Poetry Review, the Rialto, Poetry of oh, the North, and is the editor of five anthologies of poetry and fiction by emerging young writers. Her debut pamphlet, If All This Never Happened, was a winner of the Munster Fall for Poetry International Chapbook Competition in 2021, and was shortlisted for Best Poetry Pamphlet in the Saboteur Awards. She was recently shortlisted for the Marcin Crawford Award for Poetry 2022 and highly commended in the Liverpool Poetry Prize. For many years, Vicky has built development opportunities for young writers, founding Hive in 2016 for writers aged 14 to 30. Through Hive, she mentored many emerging young poets who received accolades such as the New Poets Prize and the Young Northern Writers Award. She is a recent Arvon Jerwood mentee. So please put your Zoomy muted hands together for Vicky Morris. Thank you. Hello everyone. Oh, so lovely to be here and see some uh, some faces I know. Uh, yeah, it's really, it's just honestly, uh, Flamingo is just, it's outrageously good, this, it really is. It's just fantastic. It's, it's a classic. It, it's just, and it's so lovely to be here and be part of uh, one of the many launches I'm in for it. Um, so congratulations, Catherine. Um, yeah. Um, and it's it's an honour to read with Catherine and Jonathan, both of whom are just incredible poets, um, so generous and so um, support so many people in the, in, in the poetry community and, and have me. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen, if that's all right. So... Um, is my mouse going to work? That's, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this first poem after after Julia Copus. Brother. This is the poem in which you don't suffer relentlessly at school. And the other boys never hold your head inside the toilet bowl or pin your chest to the sports hall wall to get a girl to smack you. Will you never try to score a goal in the wrong net or get called brainless by teachers? Never have the blackboard cleaner thrown at your head because your mind can't stop wandering off to fix the code on the little screen of your ZX81, then ZX Spectrum, TI 994A, Commodore 64, 128. No way. Yes, it is. It's the opening to the same poem in which you learn what chemotherapy is. And still a boy, shoulder your best friend's coffin, then run from the graveside when they lower him into the earth. The poem in which you leave the classroom, O oh, level us, after years of hermiting that tiny box room, trying to drown out your noisy sisters through the wood chip wall the constant detonations going off below, the poem in which you get your first job in a front room piled high with empty noodle pots and fine kinship 
among others who squint with the curtains shut, who like you don't care for fashion or small talk, and together you inhabit the worlds you build in crude pixels. So boys and their sisters everywhere might joyfully, recklessly pretend to speed in supercars along winding highways and mountain roads to level up and keep on going to destination high school. Now fast forward, change gear, and here you are in this poem, brother, turning it all into fuel, being the first kid, maybe the only one from school, who grew up to drive the cars you drew, the Lamborghini, the F50, not for the flash, but the speed, the impeccable design, for how the road, for how the road lies down for you, like you always knew you'd be coming. And Andrew, I know you'll tell me you don't understand poetry and you'll quibble over precise facts, but look how you ended up writing this. Look how you decided on what this poem would be. Um, so uh, this poem is in part about um, my, my brother, sorry, my brother's neurodiversity. Um, so a few years ago, I kind of found out the extent of how neuro, neurodivergent my family is um, and kind of I've written quite a few poems about it. And this was this was one of one of the poems. Uh, and so the next poem is about uh, something called executive function. So um, all of the neurodiversities, um, so um, autism, ADHD, um, dyslexia, dyspraxia, uh, very often people with those conditions have um, glitches with their executive function. So your executive function is the management system of, of the brain. So how you sequence information, how you prioritize tasks, you processing, you work in memory and things like that. Uh, so not everybody, but some people really struggle with it. And, and um, occasionally I really do. So this is a poem about... Um, envy of, of a German train because of how organised it is. German train. I wish my mind was like this German train with its neat fold-up storage, deep luggage racks, easy reach wall hooks, plenty of leg room, each seat with its own plug socket, little boxes attached for all the rubbish and wide aisleways, no waiting to pass the food trolley, a separate dining carriage for pancakes and coffee, blinds you can pull down to mute the sun, a screen charting where you're going and all the places you come from. I wish my mind was this German train, efficient, orderly, running on time, and all these thoughts traveling to who knows where, chattering, eating, sleeping, quietly crying, or lingering at the window, lost in the face, staring back. And so the next poem is about my name. Um, my first name is actually Leslie, not Vicky. Uh, my middle name is Victoria. And my mum shortened it to Vicky and I've always been Vicky. Uh, but my my first name, Leslie, I've always been aware of um, the the story behind it. So I was named after um, Leslie Ann Downey, who was the youngest victim of the Moors murderers. Um, and I've always, like I said, been aware of the story. And it's kind of, I think, I feel like it sort of coloured my childhood in a way, being, being aware of her story. And um, yeah, so this, this poem's for Leslie. Leslie. Sometimes I tell the story of my namesake, of how my mother, when she was nurse Margaret, met a young policeman in the hospital staff room, raw from listening to the evidence at Chester Assizes, the 16 minute tape that had to sit through, found in an old suitcase, station lost property, its ticket in the spine of a prayer book, how he sat and wept in his dark uniform, and she made him sugary tea, how I was named for Leslie, for her ten short years, 
for her joy at the Ancoats Boxing Day Fair, for her wide-eyed trust of the world, her tartan frock, pink cardi and red shoes, for how she called to God for mummy. And I picture my mother sat there listening, her hand on his hand, the other on her belly, me not yet kicking. She said she wanted to bring her back. She wanted to bring her home. Um, so the next poem, we're nearly there, <laughs> is just a child in memory. It's, um, yeah. Sea Road. Remember the night you and Lorne walked back this way, past the jungling cluster of amusement arcades, the bingo caller's muffled boom on the mic, the slot machine beeps and flashing lights, then the long quiet stretch of sea road. Remember the man who stopped his car not once but twice, pretended to fiddle behind a torch lit bonnet and you saw his open fly his hand offering up his cock like a fairground prize to two little girls in beach dresses, lawn still chattering, heedless of the whisper in your ten-year-old throat. And you daren't look back or turn off the road. Then up ahead, you see a shape in the dark, that same car waiting, bonnet raised, headlights off, engine ticking, the dim glow of torchlight. But this time he's upped his game and now you're running, lawn pulling you down this long empty road, running like the dark is closing in behind you, like it's stroking the backs of your legs, running from the edge of something sharp and faceless until you burst into the hall, gasping out of breath, mum shouting, what, what is it? Both of you mute, moving along the road somewhere the dark of a car boot, your mouths gagged shut. So thank you for listening. One more poem, just to, again, massive congratulations to Catherine. Um, um, so this is about my dad. So had a bit of a dysfunctional childhood. Um, Neither of my parents worked. My dad was an alcoholic and spent a lot of time in the pub. I was a bit of an absent father, but um, I wanted to write a poem that kind of honoured what he what he did give me and my sister in particular, which was words, um, I think. So this is about that. My father's work. Mum said they met at nurses post his, post his RAF days. Dad gel quiffed and cheeky in old photos with his boys in uniform, stationed in hot places with endless sand, or lounging on his camp bed, unlit James Dean sig, pin-up girl winking behind. By the time us kids came, he was doing odd jobs, manual work, a bit of catering, driving a mobility bus. This was before I compared him to the other dads in class, before I was old enough to notice the jobs had dried up, to know where he went those weekdays without a car from our tiny house, my mother vicious at the sink. One thing's for sure, nobody could say he didn't work the village pubs, the bee, the Gwindy, the harp. Each evening without fail, smart in trilby hat and old suit, he kept each one in beer. The short bloke with a tall voice, lording it at the bar, the unofficial raconteur of Abigelli. At his funeral, the old boys came to see him off. Jimmy the bins, John the paint, Idwell the fish, men with jobs in their name, men who said, your dad could tell a tale. And this we knew, those weekends we liked him best. My sister and me, our father spirited in pyjamas after hours, all gravely treacled voice and recitations that never got old. The highwayman under milk wood, the cripple boy, or at the bedroom door, stood in hunchback slow black silhouette to stretch the bogeyman. 
my father on a moonless night in our small town, all the things he knew, all the things he could have been, all the places he showed us in the dark. Thank you. Wow, thank you for that incredible, um, incredible reading, Vicky. That was, the, I just love the precision and the evocativeness of, of the imagery. Absolutely incredible. Thank you. Right then, I'm now going to welcome uh, my second favourite, Edwards from the Saren Poetry Group. No, he's my favourite, really. Um, Jonathan Edwards' first collection, My Family and Other Superheroes, uh, received the Costa Poetry Award and the Wales Book of the Year People's Choice Award and was shortlisted for the Fenton Albra First Collection Prize. His second collection, Jen, also received the Wales Book of the Year People's Choice Award. His poem about Newport Bridge was shortlisted for the Forward Prize for Best Single Poem 2019, and he has received prizes in the Lebury Festival International Poetry Competition, the Oxford Brooks International Poetry Competition, and the Cardiff International Poetry Competition. He has read his poems on BBC Radio and Television and at festivals around the world, recorded them for the Poetry Archive, and has led workshops in schools, universities and prisons, and he lives in Cross Keys, South Wales. So please welcome my favourite Edwards, Jonathan Edwards. Thanks so much, Rian. Thanks so much um, uh, for a lovely introduction. And um, uh, just an absolute honour to be here at the launch of the Poetry Pamphlet of the Year for my money. And it's just, just a complete privilege to, to read with two of my favourite poets and two of my favourite people in the world. So thank you so much to, to Catherine and Vicky for involving me in this event. And um, the poem I'm going to read first it actually picks up the baton from um, where um, Vicky uh, uh, stopped reading, almost as though we planned this um, perfectly in harmony, uh, because it's a poem about my dad. And this is part of my ongoing poetic project to essentially write down things that my dad says and put some line breaks in. Um, my dad was um, a butcher's delivery um, boy in the 1950s, and it's, it's a little known part of the history of South Wales that all of the places the butcher's delivery boys delivered to uh, were at the tops of hills. None of the places they delivered to ever were at the bottom of hills. I know this because my dad told me because he spent all of the 1950s cycling to the top of hills endlessly, and this poem is about that. My father cycling up a hill, 1957. It's the hill from the bottom, a factory trip, all the way up to Manor Farm, a Welsh hill, one long steep and steady climb to nowhere, punctuated by the occasional sharp or suicidal incline. These are his feet, his calves. They're pushing, pushing against the weight of the side of beef or lamb in the basket on the front of his bike. From his uncle's butcher shop to Manor Farm is a climb so far if I were doing it now by car, I'd think twice. By bike, no way. Yet there he is, my father, 12 years old, the weight of the hill on his legs, setting out once a week or winter to deliver the Sunday joint to old man Hodge. These are his feet, the look on his face as he pushes, pushes. This is the sweat on his brow. His uncle pays him in promises, end of week scraps, the back of his hand. It's silly to know what I do. My father is doing this for his mother, his younger brother, for his own father, who hasn't worked properly since he got back from the war. This is his front wheel, squeaking, squeaking as he inches up that hill. I know all the reasons he's doing this, and I wasn't even born then, so it's silly as can be to know what I do, that he was doing it all. Look at him, pushing and pushing all afternoon for me. Um, this next poem is a um, uh, monologue. Um, uh, I like writing monologues and getting other things to speak um, in poems because if the things do or say things that you don't like, including writing bad poems, it's not your responsibility. You know, you can just blame it on them. 
And um, this is this is a place monologue. It's what a bridge uh, might have to say for itself. The bridge in question is the bridge um, from the centre of Newport into Mainde for those people who like geographical specificity in their poems. Bridge. Me, I get up early, see. I like the hour or so before the cars arrive, the city sleeping there over my shoulder, the early morning sky that is all mine, a few girls spelling mmm out with their bodies. I make the most of that because by nine, I bear the city's weight here on my back, all these commuting cars and belching bands. I hold my nose and try to keep control with traffic lights. They lean out of their windows to swear, to drop their rubbish, spit on me, to smoke a cigarette and flick a burning butt on me. The days I like the best are Sundays when I just lie in all day. The acupuncture of a gentle moped or this hand-holding couple afternoon who linger at my apex make my view the background to their love. I've heard it said our card is marked, our day is done. What with advances in technology, hot air balloons and tunnels, gravity. But what is this but human, really? To look at the distance from here to there and say, well, what's the shortest that could be? I do not like the nights, the rivers tinnitus, and the low hum a taxi engine makes is like a dream of my own snoring. Worst are those who come to visit at that hour. Here, tonight, a young man walks alone towards my middle, dumbbelling a scotch bottle under arm. He reaches midway, looks down at the river, then clambers over, stands there on the ledge and holds on tight. I feel his warm touch there. Oh, souls, believe me, I'd never let go if I could choose. I know by heart exactly what it is to just have too much weight to bear. Um, this next poem is uh, also about water, although water of a very different kind. Um, this water is in a zoo and um, it's surrounding a hippo. Um, this poem is a kind of autobiog autobiography by hippo, really, which I think is something that every writer should have. The hippo is solo, hobo, incognito, two boulders curving out of dental murk. In a zoo, his photo advertises, doing a sponsored sitting still all day. Stop being a cliche, hippo or I won't write a poem about you, then you'll be sorry. What is your body but the verb to wallow? What is the water but a part of self? Google says you can crush a Ford Sierra between your jaws. They don't say how they test this. Candy floss high boys crowd your glass, betting they could hold their breath underwater longer. They could leap from one boulder to the other. I abandon you for the giraffes, stupid as window cleaners, the lions, sunshine with teeth, but keep coming back. If you would arise, show your eyes, your mouth, would you have Martin Sheen's mud crazy face breaking smoke water in apocalypse now? Closing time, one last go. Oh, please, hippo, don't be so self-effacing, so tight-fisted. Come on out. Don't you know we love you? Wait, is that a flash of flesh, a hippo, peep show, or are you still snoozing? A little girl says, Dad, that island's moving. And... Um, just one last poem. I, I heard um, a couple of weeks ago they're, they're decommissioning um, uh, fax machines because I think basically mobile phones have taken over. I don't know how you get the 
piece of fax machine paper into a mobile phone. You just fold it up really small or something, I suppose. Um, but this this reminded me that um, the fax machine was um, one of the ways that Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love pursued their courtship. So this is a love poem, basically, about the two of them um, uh, and the, the role of the fax machine in that courtship. This poem has such a long title that if I attempt to read it, I'll be so exhausted that I won't be able to read the poem. So I'm going to outsource the reading of the title to you and you can read it um, from the screen. Uh, I'll finish this poem, right? Before I do, I just wanted to say, uh, say again a massive thank you to Catherine and Vicky. Um, I feel tremendously grateful um, to have these two amazing people in my life as friends and to know um, just how kind and how brilliant they are, as well as the phenomenal writers they are. And all of you, I would run out immediately into the rain after this, um, maybe get an umbrella on the way uh, after this reading to a bookshop. And if it's closed, just um, smash on the door or something and make them open to sell you their two pamphlets because they're fantastic. The facts will later be found folded in the inside pocket of a jacket in a wardrobe at the house you will die in. It will be auctioned for $50,000 in a lot which includes the jacket, a Nirvana logo frisbee, a toothbrush you may once have used. It will be quoted in a biography. It will take the writer four years and 400 interviews to complete. And the quotation will be hotly disputed by Love herself or the legal representatives of Love herself. There are three years between the facts being sent and Cobain's death, three years, in which he gets married, becomes a father, sells four million records, and consumes so much heroin, Seattle fills with dealers who will not sell to him. None of that matters to the man who stands here now, the business center of a five-star hotel in Amsterdam, two in the morning, waiting for a fax from the woman he loves. She's on tour with her band in Chicago, or he forgets, Boston, and he's hunched here at the fax machine, waiting for it to print so, so slowly. 20 years before smartphones, texts, Tinder, and the most famous musicians on the planet are in different time zones, wooing each other by facts. Now his eyes scan down past the explicit sexual reference, the scatological puns, the allusions to the lyrics of obscure guitar bands, the straightforward gobbledygook to what he wants to see, the way she signs off. There are holes in his sweater, track marks in his arms. The latest estimate puts his personal fortune at $3 million. And anyone passing the glass wall of the business center now, walking along this plush, plush carpet, may look in and see this. A man alone in a room, tearing from a machine a fax, then punching the air, then hugging it to his chest, then beginning slowly, shyly, shufflingly to dance. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for your constant verve and humour. And again, the authenticity of your voice is always a pleasure to listen to. Thank you. Right, let's welcome back the lady of the hour. So I'm, you've heard all the other bits. So I'm gonna say what Liz Berry says about this wonderful pamphlet. This pamphlet is a delight, vibrant and fresh. Each of its poems from the tenderest honeymoon address to the bold inventive voices of its heroines zings with vivacity and defiance. Never shying away from what is hard or painful. These poems keep rebellion as their lodestar conjuring an energy which shines with wit and compassion. And may I say, it would make the perfect stocking filler as well for all of those of you who have bought a copy. So please, let us welcome back the incredible Catherine Bevis. 
Oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah, a great sc stocking filler for people that like quite, quite dark poems. <laughs> I would put that in there. Um, but every good house should have one, obviously. Um, just a joy to listen to Vicky and, and Jonathan read. I'm so, I, I knew I wanted the two of them. We've got this kind of triangle of, of uh, respect and, uh, and love going on. Um, you know, I just wanted to say, I will say thank yous at the end, but just, uh, John, you know, two thirds of the poem, poems in this book were written in your workshops and received your mentoring. So thank you. This book just wouldn't be here without your, your influence. And Vicky, you and I have become recent friends and, and you're just such a top class editor. Again, you've really helped me up my game. Um, so I'll say that about you as poets and I'll thank you as people a bit later on. Um, OK, so let me let me crack on. Uh, a little bit of context for this final five poems. So the, um, in, in, in March 25th this year, I received um, a diagnosis of stage four breast cancer. Um, and that's obviously been something quite you know big to get my head around. And for my family and my husband and all the people, friends and loved ones in my life to get their head around it too. Um, but obviously being you know a poet, it's something I want to write about. And what I found a lot is, is that people, even friends, even like really well-meaning, lovely people, um, often use the language of battle or fight or war with me when they describe um, my relationship with my cancer or my relationship with my body. Um, and it, that doesn't speak to me, really. Um, I think I'm trying to find a language uh, to to speak about those relationships um, and actually this the, the five poems in the rest of the set they are about relationships so my relationship to my body my relationship to my cancer uh, my relationship to my stepfather Ray um, and and then a couple at the end love poems uh, to, to my husband Dolly my body tells me that she's filing for divorce she's taken a good hard look at the state of our relationship she knows it's not for her. The worst thing is, she doesn't tell me this straight up or even to my face. No. She books us appointments with specialists in strip lit rooms. They peer at us over paper masks with eyes whose kindness I can't bear. They speak of our marriage in images. A pint of milk that's on the turn. An egg whose yolk is punctured leaking through the rest, a tree whose one rotten root is poisoning the leaves. I try to understand how much of us is sick. I want to know what they can do to put us right. She, whose soft shape I have lain with every night, who's roamed with me in rocky woods, round rocky heads. She, who's witnessed the rain pattering on the reed beds, the cut glass chitter of long-tailed tits, the woodpecker rehearsing her single high syllable. How have we become this bitter pill whose name I can't pronounce? Soon she'll sleep in a bed that isn't mine. That's why these nights we perform our trial separations. She buried in blankets, eyelids flickering fast. Me up there on no wait through the ceiling, attic, roof. I'm flying, crying, looking down. Too soon, I whisper to my walk to her warm and sleeping form. Not yet. Too soon. Too soon. One of the ways I found to write about uh, this experience, this relationship um, with my cancer is to use the language um, that I borrow from the animal kingdom. So language about habitat, predation, um, territory and so on. My cancer as a ring-tailed lemur. We both know one day she'll eat me, but for now we dance. A little game of catch me if you can. Tracking her is difficult but specialists are interested and bit by bit, they creep inside my body's forest, stalk her with their fancy cameras, take images, write reports. On ultrasound, she's punk rock stripes of white and black, 
on mammograms, she sunbathes, downy as a dandelion gone to seed. The child I am divines the time by blowing. Five years, 10 years, 20, more. That's when they spy her up in the canopy. Her tail, Rapunzel's plait, looped round a single sentinel node. Now on MRI, they spot her kindly spaniel's face crammed into the lettuce of my breast. At last, on PET CT, they catch her on the move. She's up and off all right, a lope, a leap. She careens through my branches, omnivorous for bone and liver, brain. Because her nature is to double herself again, again, she and her sisters huddle, tails conjoined, tiny arms about each other's necks. The child I am learns to prophesy afresh, blows one year, two years, four years, five. Friends say, this is war, and I'm a warrior, a tower of strength. But the Lima and I get on okay. I figure she has a right to be here. She is, in some important sense, endangered too. I draw the line at poisoning, but let the hunters starve her most days. She looks at me with orange eyes of ire as we witness our habitat's destruction. My new need for naps, my breathlessness. For both of us, a forest fire. So this is my poem uh, about Ray Holloway, my wonderful stepfather. Uh, when he died, on the day he died, uh, a butterfly uh, came to the window. It's January the 2nd, like a butterfly should really not have been out, but sometimes red admirals do pop out at that time of the year. Happens again the day of his funeral. Some things are just meant to be, aren't they? You do get, I, I'm a big believer in, in signs and things and, 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 and people do report seeing odd birds at odd times of year and, and, and dragonflies and all sorts of things on, on important days like this. Uh, so this is for him. The Butterfly House. Yours is the only death I've ever known. We sat with you for hours and stroked your hands. And though it was January, the pond a frozen oval, though each blade of grass had etched itself against the ground, and each frail thing had hidden from the stalking frost. A butterfly flew to your window, sudden and strange, with wings that throbbed like a heart. The day we buried you, we saw another, crimson sails unfurled, its body putting out to sea. Today's a pilgrimage, a rest in mist and heat. Red lace wings gather their silk skirts as I trace a swallowtail's trembling pulse. Together, apart, together, a pair of blue morphos shiver like black fringed scraps of sky. Clear as leaded panes, glass wings feast on nectar. They close themselves like hands that meet in prayer, then open up again to cup the tropic air. Since my diagnosis, I see them every time I close my eyes. They're flaming wings. They're two short lives. So kind of reading up and thinking about grief, I, I didn't know that um, there are creatures in the animal kingdom and not just the big brained ones either that, that, that exhibit forms of grief. It's really not the done thing to try and anthropomorphize um, animal behavior and try and find reasons for it, like the emotions we, we feel. But um, there's been quite a lot of research that show that it's not, it's not just human beings that, that grieve. How animals grieve. We Google it. Laid on our backs in bed together cursed by our tired three pound brains. We search our phone's blue light for wisdom, become voyeurs of YouTube clips on other creatures' pain. 
For 17 days, a mourning orca attends her dead son's corpse. She sinks and hauls the weight of him as if to fetch the breath back, have him suckle once again. A chimp will carry her lifeless child for months. She lets the troop draw close to her, hold her, hear her screech. They watch her comb the straw from listless fur and floss with grass between its teeth. Elephants know to sniff beloved bones. They seek to raise the fallen, rock their own bulk back and forth. Each one waits its turn to stroke and roll the skull, slow blow through its trunk, take time to bury its dead. Like us, giraffes and house cats, dingoes, horses, dogs, forget to forage, forego sex and sleep. Like us at burial mounds, they pace and yowl and keen. So why should it surprise us, Ollie? Us who matter most to one another. Us whose marriage is as deep as marrow. Why is this loss unthinkable? Me without you. You without me. So I'm going to finish with the title poem uh, of the collection and I just uh, want to say some thank yous beforehand so thank you so much Rian and Zoe I I'm not sure if Zoe's here but thank you um, so much for being the wonderful editors that you are um, and for the whole Sarah team including Rian and Zoe so Sarah and uh, Jamie and Mick as well and everybody else that's worked on this book thank you for being so responsive and flexible you've got this book out time you know in my well time which means a massive amount to me thank you um and then Vicky and John I just can't tell you how much it means to me to be sharing this with you this whole evening I won't say more or I'll tear up um but honestly it's just, it's just um magnificent uh, to have you to have you with me on this thank you more than I can say Flamingo my love when I die, I'll turn flamingo, fall asleep, face tucked in on the pillow of myself. Even as you cry, I'll be stepping from the bed, feeling plush, pink, tall, tutuing from my hips. My legs will telescope, grow thin and rosy. I'll sense my feet web, feel a new itch to stamp and stir, to suck up larvae from the bottom of the lagoon. In this afterworld, some days I'll fix one foot in mud, find infinite repose, the poise of a yogi in prayer. Others, I'll gorge myself, filter feed on brine shrimp from the salty shadows. The other birds and I will grunt and growl over the choicest cuts like church women bickering over rosettes for jam at a country show. My love, do you know that the dead all flock together? We meet at the saline lake, dance our shuffle-legged shimmy, flick our heads like tango partners, flag and flap our scarlet scalloped wings, heads bopping, nodding to the beat. Do you see, after the illness, after the grief, the pain, as you will do, sweetheart, the dead must learn to love again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Catherine, for those absolutely heart-rendingly sublime poems. Oh God, I'm a mess, I'm a mess. It's not everywhere. Thank you so, so much to Vicky Morris and Jonathan Edwards as well for your incredible readings as well. I think it's safe to say there is a lot of love in this Zoom room for you, Catherine, this evening. Thank you so much for letting us publish such a beautiful pamphlet. It's an absolute pleasure and honour. I'd also like to say thank you to Sarah, the Deputy Publisher of Saren, for being the brains that keeps this all to together. Um, a massive, humongous thank you to Catherine, to Vicky, to Jonathan Edwards, and to all of you who um, checked in this evening to 
to basically behold this incredible launch event. Thank you so, so much.